Hey, good morning, 7th grade. Welcome back. Happy, uh, I believe when you see this, it's going to be a Wednesday. Happy Wednesday to you. And we are so close. So very close. You guys smell that? It smells like spring break. We are so close. I mean, we're talking, what, two days? Two days. But, uh, hey, welcome back to the, uh, I believe, the second installment of Learning Math with Mr. Bauman in Mr. Bauman's basement. So, here we are. I'm just slowly moving my way around the basement. Um, we're here next to uh, our pool table. I'm here by the corner pocket. In case you were wondering, these are these are record album covers uh, that we have on our wall. And uh, here we go. We're going to jump right back into uh, Chapter 10. I hope uh, that you were able to uh, follow the uh, video uh, a couple days ago. And uh, I hope it didn't put you to sleep. Because that was not my intent. But I'm going to give this my best shot again. That's all I'm asking all of us to do. Just give it our best shot. Uh, I know we're in some unorthodox uh, ways of, of teaching and learning. But we are making the, the most of what we have. And we have each other. So here we go. Uh, moving on into chapter uh, 10, section 3. Looking at the difference between here, two big words here. Theoretical probability. And experimental probability. Think about those two words for a second. Theoretical. If something is theoretical, in theory, blank, 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 blank. Versus experimental probability. So the experiment that we're conducting yields or produces these results. Two kind of different things that we're measuring here. That's what we're going to look at today. How are these two related? How are they different? How can we measure each of these? And how can we make them closer to one another? How can we get the experimental and the theoretical to become a little bit closer together if at, at first they're kind of far apart? So that's kind of the goal for today. Again, this is section 10.3. I'm going to zoom in here a little bit and um, utilize this whiteboard that I found. Got the whiteboard. Got the 1998 video camera going here. Let me pull this back up a bit. Mr. Bauman has still not found his razor. There we go. And yeah, that'll work. So, oh, most importantly, you got it. Good old black coffee. It's about uh, about 9:30 in the morning. Today's Tuesday, but you guys have seen this Wednesday. But regardless of what day. Black coffee is always, always a good way to start a day. Always a good way to start a math lesson. So, here we go. Section 10.3. Experimental versus... We're going to have a little battle here. Experimental versus theoretical probability. Forgot to uh, remind you, if you need to run and go get your notebook, any old notebook will do. If it's math notebook, great. If it's not, great. Just earmark it as your math notes when we return on May the 1st, you might need to be transferring some of these uh, home notes, these e-learning notes, to uh, or at least just rip them out of the current notebook and put them in your math notebook when you get to school. But here's our objective. If you need to pause the video, go, by, uh, go, go ahead by all means and do that. Be able to describe and measure both experimental, so I just abbreviated it here, experimental and theoretical probability. Describe and measure it. And, I'm reading backwards here, I think that says analyze, and analyze when they become closer. Alright, so these two words, experimental and theoretical probability, what do they mean and how can we get them to be closer. Let me find, I've got some uh, things to help us out here. So let's talk about theoretical. Why? I talk, I'm going to erase this board. Let's talk about uh, theoretical. So uh, obviously the root word of theoretical is theory. So if, if you have a theory, you kind of have this, this idea that you think should be true, but may not be true. Um, in theory, if I flip this coin, this penny, if I flip this coin, in theory, I should get heads half the time. 
I should get tails half the time. That's in theory. Now, if I run a bunch of experiments, if I conduct an experiment and I run some trials, could I get heads every single time? It's possible. Could I get tails every single time? It's possible. But in theory, I should get heads half the time and tails half the time. So sometimes experimental and theoretical probability actually become equal to each other. Not often, but they could. Oftentimes they're two separate numbers. Let's, let's try a couple of examples here in just a moment. But let's try to um, define, just in your own words, what you believe theoretical and experimental really mean in your own words. So I'm just going to write those two words here on my whiteboard. I want you to take about 20 seconds and just come up with your own descriptors for the words theoretical and the word experimental. Pause the video, take about 20 seconds. In your own words, what does the word theoretical and the word experimental mean? All right, so here's what I came up with. And again, obviously I can't look at yours right now, but uh, I might ask you to do that in your homework on Google Classroom. I might ask you uh, to define what you believe your own, in your own words, what theoretical and experimental mean. But here's what I came up with. Theoretical, this is what's expected to happen. In theory, it's not supposed to rain today. I don't know if it is or not, because the day hasn't happened yet. But in theory, today, Tuesday, yeah, I don't think it's supposed to rain today. It's, it's what expected to happen. On the other hand, experimental, this is what actually happens based off of a sample space. And right before we left, right before we left school about a week and a half ago, we talked about the word sample space, what that means. It's a small group, it's a smaller subset of the whole population that hopefully the sample space is a true, accurate representation of the entire population. So experimental probability is what actually happened based off of the sample space, the trials that are included in that sample space. So let's, let's try to put this into practice and then we'll come up with our own kind of working formula for this. Let's go to the coin. So, in theory, let's talk about the heads. Good old Abe. Honest Abe. We should get Honest Abe 50% of the time. Upside down Abe. We should get him 50% of the time. So if I flip this coin, before, before I flip it, let's write this as a probability. Race real fast with my magical eraser. I should get probability of getting heads. Probability of getting, I'm just going to say probability of getting Abe. Good old Abraham Lincoln, one of my favorite presidents. Probability of getting Abe in theory, so I'm going to call this, I'm going to label this the theoretical probability, the theoretical probability of getting Abe should be what? That's right. The favorable outcomes, there's only one favorable outcome. That's getting heads. That goes on the top. Out of the total possible outcomes, which obviously on a coin, there's only two. In my 43 years of living, I've never seen a coin 
land on its edge. So we're going to say the probability of getting Abe or getting heads is 1 out of 2. Obviously we could write that as a decimal and then we could convert that into a percent. 0.5 or 50 percent chance. That's in theory. Two great words to use in math, especially when talking about probability, are the words in theory. So in theory we should get a 50 percent of the time. Now, that's different from the experimental probability. I don't know what the experimental probability is yet because I haven't conducted the experiment. But the experimental probability, I'm just going to start abbreviating these words, is based on repeat, repeated trials. Experimental probability is based on repeated trials. So if I just flip the coin once and I get tails, does that mean my theoretical probability is wrong? Of course not. I didn't conduct enough trials. If my first one I get tails and I'm like, well that's that shoots my uh, theoretical probability out of the water, it's, 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 it's an inaccurate statement because I didn't conduct enough trials. So if that's the case, Let's come up with a kind of a working formula for theoretical probability. Theoretical probability. Again, if you can get this in your notes, even if you have to pause the video to make sure you get this. Theoretical probability. Again, we're going to use capital P. So the probability of some event occurring. In this case, it's the probability of getting heads. Very similar to what we talked about in the last couple days. It's the number And I'm going to abbreviate a little bit because my whiteboard's just not quite big enough. It's the number of favorable outcomes. So the probability of some event that's not a hashtag. Believe it or not, there's a time in life where this symbol right here did not mean hashtag. That's a number sign for anyone uh, above the age of 20. Okay, maybe 30. That's the number of favorable outcomes divided by the number of possible outcomes. Move this down a bit. Divided by the number of possible outcomes. Sorry, I had to move the camera. Which for us, this should already be in your notes, the probability of getting heads, there's one favorable out of two possible. As opposed to, and then we're going to conduct the experiment here in just a second, as opposed to experimental probability, probability of the same event occurring is now not based off of theory, not what should happen, but what actually did happen. So it's based off of repeated trials. So this would be the number times the favorable event occurred. It's kind of a lot to put on the numerator of this fraction the number of times the favorable event occurred. Sorry about the messy handwriting. So how many times did it actually happen? In reality, not in theory, but in reality, how many times did we get heads? That's what we're going to do here in just a second. Divided by the number of trials that we are going to conduct. If you need to pause the video, I know there's a lot of words there. All right, I'm going to conduct this experiment. If you don't want to have to watch all 10 of these, I'm going to conduct 10 trials. If you don't want to have to sit there and watch me flip a coin 10 times, I'm not offended by that. It takes a lot to offend me, and I get a little bit of space here. 
you not watching me flip a coin ten times is in no way going to offend me. <sighs> oh my gosh, I love black coffee. Alright, here we go. We're going to do ten trials. Out of these ten trials, how many, in theory, should be heads? Obviously it's five. Is, is there a chance I could do that? Of course there's a chance. But we're going to find out if it actually happened. So if the experimental matched up with the theoretical. I know you can't see it, but that's a heads. And I need to make some tally marks here. Alright, heads, tails. So, so far, heads is winning one to nothing. Here we go. Honest Abe. That one fell. That one didn't count. That's a tails. One to one. That's two down. If you're still watching, I appreciate it. I know this is not the most exciting thing in the world to do, to watch your teacher flip a coin in his basement, but look at you, you're such a trooper. That was a tails, by the way. Heads one, tails two. Heads. Two to two so far. The theory and the experimental are so far, they're matched up. They, they're equal to each other. Because right now I'm right at 50%. I'm two out of four for heads. Here we go. Flip number five. That's the tails. Flip number six, if you're keeping track at home. Ooh, another tails. Come on, Abe. I got two heads, four tails. Here we go. This is, this is exciting. Almost just as exciting as watching paint dry. And that's a heads. You guys ever sit there and watch paint dry? How about watching water boil? That's also not very exciting. How about watching the grass grow? Also, not that exciting. Here we go. Flip number, what are we on? Eight? And it's a tails. So I have a count of three heads, five tails, and so far, what can you say about theoretical versus experimental? Are they equal as of now? No, they're not, because I'm not anywhere near 50%. Okay, I'm kind of close, but I'm definitely not equal to 50%. So if I stop my trials right now, I would say that my theoretical probability and my experimental probability are not equal. All right, here we go. Two more flips, right? Because we're at three to five. Ooh, honest Abe, back again. Four to five, last one. We got tails. That was close. Holding my breath. But I've got a final count of four heads, six tails. So now that we've done some trials, we didn't do a whole lot. I know you had to watch that and you're thinking, that was way too many, Mr. Bowman. That was not the most exciting thing in the world. But I appreciate you watching. Probability of heads. We're going to call this the experimental probability. How many times did our favorable event occur? It was four times. Out of the number of trials that we did, I labeled this experimental probability. So this is based off of trials. It was four tenths which again, we can write that as a decimal, convert it into a percent. So my experimental probability was 40%. My finger's out of the way, there we go. Experimental probability was 40%. My theoretical probability, which should be in your notes, write it up here real fast, my theoretical probability was 50%. So two different numbers. And just by chance, they were not equal. Could they have been equal? Of course. So what would make these two numbers, what would increase the likelihood that my theoretical probability and my experimental probability got closer together? In other words, the, di the discrepancy, the difference between these two numbers shrank. What would make these two numbers 
more likely to be closer to each other? Interesting question. Let's try one more uh, trial or experiment and see if this one gives us experimental and theoretical that are equal. So, went around my house, tried to find things that <sighs> never gets old. Uh, that would yield some some probability thinking, some some uh, some things around our house that uh, got me thinking about likelihood and and probability of things happening. And here's what I came up with. So I have uh, this twister spinner. This twister spinner. We got. We're not going to look at the colors. We're just looking at the feet and the hands. We got uh, left foot, right foot, left hand, uh, right hand. Four sections. We all in agreement there? Four sections. So in theory, I should get right hand, I should get right hand one-fourth of the time, right? So my probability, my experimental, or excuse me, my theoretical probability my theoretical probability of getting, uh, let's go, let's go right hand. Theoretical probability of right hand, there's one section on the board that's right hand, but there's four total sections. So my theoretical probability of getting right hand is one-fourth, which obviously that's 0.25, 25%. If we use one of the descriptors from the other day, it's unlikely for me to get right hand. So let's do a quick experiment. This time I'm only going to do four trials. And I want to see what my experimental probability becomes. In theory, I should get right hand one time out of these four trials. All right, let's give this a try. Spin number one. Big money, big money. Ooh, look at that. Right off the bat, I got right hand. So, so far, right hand one, everything else zero. Here we go, spin number two, big money, no whammies, no whammies. Left foot. Left foot. So, so far, it's one to one. Here we go. Big money, big money, no whammies. Left foot again. So, so far I've done three trials, only one of them has been favorable. Last one, big money, big money, left hand. So, so far, I've only done four trials, and that's all I'm going to do. I'm not going to bore you with any more. The probability of right hand, the number of favorable uh, events that occurred was one out of my four trials. So, sometimes theoretical probability does match up to the experimental. Let's try one more and then I want to kind of end with kind of a summary statement of how we can get, how, can, how, we, how we can increase the likelihood of the experimental and the theoretical uh, aligning up uh, more often. Let me grab my Chromebook here. Let's see if I can find this example for you to write down so if you need to pause your screen go ahead and do so but if you can get at least paraphrase this this problem it says the letters in the word Jackson it's actually my nephew's name you probably know some Jacksons probably know lots of Jacksons the letters in the word Jackson placed are placed in a hat. Again, I'm reading this backwards. They're placed in a hat. You randomly choose a letter from the hat. What is the theoretical probability of choosing a vowel? What is the theoretical probability of choosing a vowel? So if we look at the word Jackson, there are two vowels, right? I feel like I'm on, I feel like I'm on Wheel of Fortune. It's an A and an O. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven letters 
in the word Jackson. So the theoretical probability of choosing a vowel from the word Jackson, so let me paraphrase this, this is theoretical probability of choosing a vowel, and you could do the same thing for your own name, which would be kind of interesting if we had the, the whole class here and and we kind of took a, a survey of who had uh, the highest probability of choosing a vowel from their name. Gosh, I'm trying to think of a name whose who's, uh, who's name would be a, a higher probability. Um, right. Uh, my youngest daughter, Betsy, her real name is Elizabeth. She has one, two, three, four vowels out of five, six, seven, eight, nine. Four out of nine, that's relatively high. But if you had a, a name like Al, you're already at 50%. Um, so try it. Try it with your own name. I'd be at 50%. I'm Doug. D-O-U-G, that's 50%. So try it. See if anyone, uh, email me. If you have a name, if your name uh, puts you at higher than 50%, email me. I'm curious to see, uh, for, for vowels, uh, who has the highest percent in the class. But anyways, let's go back to Jackson. So the theoretical probability of choosing a vowel, he had two, right? Two out of seven. I'm curious what that is as a decimal. Borrowing Annie's calculator here. Two divided by seven. That is very much irrational. So I'm just going to go maybe three decimal places. I have about 0.285. I'm going to go actually four decimal places. 0.2857. So the theoretical probability of choosing a vowel from the name Jackson is two sevenths point two eight five seven. If I convert that into a percent, that's about this is round to the nearest whole percent. That's about thirty percent. About thirty percent. Which, by the way, that's about. Three tenths, about three tenths. Now, why did why did I approximate that? Because I want to conduct ten trials. I'm going to try this, and again, I apologize if this bores you just watching me pick letters. But try it, try, try it at home with your own name. Do the, do the do the probability of choosing a vowel with your own name. See what percent you come up with. For Jackson, it was about thirty percent. For me, it was about fifty percent. And then conduct some trials and see what your experimental probability comes up with. So our theoretical probability is about three-tenths. Right now, I'm going to conduct it real quick. I just realized I got a Zoom call with someone here in about five minutes. I'm going to kind of speed up the end of this lesson. Hold the applause for later. <laughs> uh, the experimental probability, let's try this out. This is again for the word, for the name Jackson. I'm going to do 10 trials. I'm going to do 10 trials. I'm going to do this, not blindfolded, but I am going to close my eyes. I've got the letters of Jackson here on little pieces of paper, all the same size paper. So O, S, you get the picture. I'm not going to do this for every letter. I hope you believe me. They're all here. I'm going to put them on my whiteboard. I'm going to close my eyes, and I'm going to start drawing. Here we go. Look at that, right off the bat, I've got an O. Keep some tally marks here. So one trial, one vowel. Next one, shuffle them up. Next one, N. Next one, S. That's three trials and so far I only have one vowel. Next one, K. Another consonant. Shuffle them up, eyes closed, and I got a J. Again, out of 10 trials, how many should I get? That's right, I should get about three. I approximated, but it should be about three. I'm going to do 10 trials. K, yeesh. So, so far I'm one vowel, five consonants. Next one, 
C. Six consonants, one vowel. Next one, N again. One vowel, seven consonants. What do we got? Two more, right? Two more picks. And I got a K. This is actually this is actually good because it, it goes to show you that they're not always equal, and we're going to talk about how we can make them more equal. And I've got one more pick. Here we go. And we got an N. Look at that. So my experimental probability, I got one vowel out of let me move these papers back on the pool table. And it kind of got erased a little bit, but you know what it says. Probability of a vowel, for me, experimental, was one-tenth. Obviously, that's 10%. So my experimental probability was, consider I would say, considerably lower than my theoretical probability. Last question. How can I get this number, this experimental probability, closer to the theoretical probability? Think for a second. Well, I get a drink of coffee. What can I do to the sample space to make the theoretical? Yeah, yeah. I've already I've told them I'm speeding this up. Yeah, I just got my my two minute warning for my Zoom call. Uh, how can I get the what What can I do to the sample space to make the experimental probability closer to? the theoretical probability. Right now there's a fairly large discrepancy. I was at 10% uh, for my experimental probability, but 30% for my theoretical. There's a fairly large difference or discrepancy between the two. What can I do to the sample space so that these numbers, these two probabilities, become more aligned? That's right. If I increase the sample space, so instead of doing 10 trials, what if I did 10,000 trials? What if I did 10 million trials, the difference between my experimental probability and the theoretical probability, the difference will shrink. They will become more aligned. They will have closer alignment or what we call in probability closer agreement. They will agree more the more trials that you conduct. I'm not going to sit here and bore you with 10 million uh, picks of these pieces of paper trying to get a vowel, but I think you get the idea. If I did this experiment 10,000 times or 10 million times or 10 trillion times, the experimental and the theoretical would become closer. There you go. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you tuning in to the second installment of Learning Math with Mr. Bauman from Mr. Bauman's Basement. Next time I see you, uh, it'll be after spring break. So I wish all of you a very safe, happy, joyful, uh, relaxing spring break. I hope it's full of lots of sleeping in, uh, staying up late, watching movies, uh, enjoying some good food, enjoying some good company with your family. And above all, I hope that you uh, continue to be kind to one another, continue to be patient with one another, especially your family. And uh, above all, above all, um, please continue to pray. It is so important uh, in these times, all times, but especially now that we continue to pray for one another continue to pray for uh, peace, both in our world and our country, but in our homes, uh, within ourselves, some inner peace, uh, and ask God to continue to be with us and bless us with his abundance of, of gifts and, and blessings. Uh, we have a lot to be thankful for. So please continue to pray uh, for each other. Know that, uh, that I'm keeping each of you in my daily prayers uh, for your safety and well-being uh, always, uh, especially during spring break. So until we see each other again, uh, thanks for tuning in, and uh, have a wonderful spring break. Thanks, guys. I, I really do miss you a lot. We'll see you uh, in about a week. Unless you're Lily Bauman, I'll see you in like two minutes. All right, see ya.